and do his thing, but I'm willing to do that because I am who I am. I'll do anything I got to do to try to get my record straight and whatever. If I beat him in MMA, then that's a good thing for me. So it's all going to boil down to who is a real man and who's going to do what we said we's going to do. If he wants to box, we box. If he wants to get in there and kick and get down and rap and all that shit, we'll do that shit too. But I've been training for eight weeks to fucking fight, to box, and that's what I plan on doing. Thank you. Let me seal his head. Mercer's pissed already. He's like, what is he kicking for? I thought it was supposed to be a boxing match. Before we start the video, let's clarify, what is a side mission? It's pretty much anything that is out of the ordinary in boxing or within each boxing culture. For an example, it's the norm for non-American blue chip fighters to travel to America and fight depending on status and climate in that weight class. For Americans that's not required because of entitlement, no media push, and fears of getting robbed. Shoot it all. I, don't, I don't know what you call a serious fight. but. I'm hoping I can fight Darius after this fight, if that's what y'all consider a serious fight. So you're saying you will fight Mekoshevsky, but you will not fight him in Germany? No, I'm not going to Germany. Simple. Which more foreign fighters get robbed in some form in the States than any other nation. Benoit with Oscar, their pay-per-view, television board, see, it's a question of the money. I was a better fighter, I win this fight. And when Oscar loves sport, how we say it? And he gives me a rematch, but when Oscar loves money, he fight Benin, leave the ring, and come never back. So you don't think he will ever want any part of you again? <laughs> I think so. Making it out of the ordinary when Americans do mount up the courage to make that voyage overseas. I'll be going over that as well as the obvious exhibition matches. With that being said, let's start the video. The 22-0 Terence Crawford made the honorable voyage to the UK to fight WBO lightweight champion Ricky Burns. Crawford had built up a fine reputation from prospect to contender defeating Bradis Prescott, Alejandro Sanabria, and Andre Clermont to earn his shot. The fight started off relatively even, and Crawford would show to the world he's the real deal, taking over the fight and finished very strong in the 12th round to earn the unanimous decision to become the WBO lightweight champion. The new WBO lightweight champion of the world. After becoming the light heavyweight champion, Archie Moore would make a defense here and there, but mostly fought non-title fights. After two straight title defenses on the road, one in the UK and the other in Canada, the 159 and 20 Archie Moore was set to face famous pro wrestler Roy Shire on his boxing debut in a 10 round non-title bout. The fight would go three rounds and was forced to end due to a cut. The two will form a relationship and will have wrestling match events together in the following years. Jack Dempsey was retired from boxing for, for pretty much over 10 years and occasionally he would ref pro wrestling matches. Jack would have a run in with a wrestler Cowboy Luttrell which resulted in an argument in the ring. Not staged, very real. This caught wind by businessman Max Waxman who got the two together and set up this bad blood matchup. The 45 year old Dempsey would obliterate Cowboy Luttrell but the problem was Luttrell wouldn't concede and the ref was refusing to stop the fight. This fight here could have at least been stopped three to four times if it happened in the 80s and above. Dempsey would set up one last offense and knock Luttrell out of the ring, which judging by the fact that Luttrell didn't see it coming and how high he fell, there was no recovering from that, resulting in a KO. Well, thank you very much, Pat. That was a grand exhibition for you to referee. I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I, I think it was a nice fight. It was a good comeback fight for me. This fellow's a tough fellow, and a game fellow, and a good fighter. Well, best of luck to you, Jack, and anything else you might try to accomplish in the future. Thank you very much, Matt. Jack Johnson was set up to fight middleweight Stanley Ketchell in a 20 round title fight. Obviously this was supposed to have been a fix. It's a title fight and disguised as an exhibition fight. Johnson promised to promoters he would not knock out Stanley. Stanley promised he wouldn't try to win, so pretty much they were going to keep it easy just like a light sparring session, which was going as planned till the 12th round. Ketchell stepped away from the script and threw a punch with the intentions of knocking Johnson out. Johnson didn't see this coming 
fighting and was floored in the process. Johnson angrily gets up, immediately knocks Stanley out cold. Jack's punch was so hard that it had knocked out numerous teeth out of Stanley's mouth. As seen in the tape, Stanley's whole mouth pretty much is embedded into Johnson's glove. Johnson would casually brush them off his glove into the canvas. Before we get back to the rest of the video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe with the notification bell if you're new. Liking and commenting helps the rest of the good old subscribers see the latest uploads. This week's comment section topic is, what was your favorite fight party? Leave in the comments. For me, it was back in 2011 with Pacquiao vs. Mosley. I didn't really have too many friends in high school. It was fairly racially divided where I lived. Due to my odd background, I was more accepted among the Hispanic community, which I'll socialize and be invited to fight parties, which was pretty cool. I had one Filipino friend who was a huge Pacquiao fan. His family would usually throw fight parties whenever Manny fights, but due to his dad's military deployment, he missed quite a bit of fights because of it. So they hadn't thrown a watch party in a while. Pacquiao vs. Mosley was luckily falling on his final weekend of leave before he had to go back to the Middle East, and the whole family threw a massive fight party for him. At least 20 to 25 people filled up the house. It was an experience I would never forget. Eating traditional Filipino food, laughing up with the Titos and does. And when it came to the fight, everyone was passing around a basket and you had to put money down and write down which round Manny would beat Mosley. Out of everyone, the old man won the basket. I'll never forget when Manny dropped Mosley, that whole house was shaking. It was the coolest thing to just be around all of that and experiencing this type of fight culture. Well, that's my story. Thanks for sticking around to the end and let's get back to the video. After two straight losses against Chad Dawson, the rematch being the most decisive loss out of the two, the former undisputed champ would shock setting Roy Jones Jr. in the first round, ruining the promotion for the highly anticipated rematch against Bernard Hopkins. For a guy like that, for a legend like that, to be stopped like that, you man gotta go out a little better than that though. Now Bernard, I know you've had tougher days than that in your life, but what was it like to wake up this morning to see that, that result? No, I didn't see it just now. Cause I blocked that out of my mind because I had a tough guy in there, as you see. So tell me, what was your reaction just hearing the result? I know that you were living for well, this fight. My, my thing was, how did he get knocked out? And defeating undefeated cruiserweight contender BJ Flores. Tarver has not looked this energetic and this impressive since the Glenn Johnson and the first two Roy Jones Jr. fights. Dropping Green in the second round and just to pummel him round after round before the fight was ultimately stopped in the ninth round. Briefly reviving the career of Tarver. <laughs> So, Daisuke Naido, after becoming part of flyweight history, being the guy to be knocked out the fastest in flyweight championship history against WBC and lineal champion Pung Saklek Wangjung Kam, would find his way back in the rankings, earn a rematch, then earn another rematch, and finally get his revenge, defeating him in the third fight to become the man at flyweight. All while this was happening, the Kamado brothers were on the rise. You couldn't escape without seeing them on television. The amount of hype for these guys was indescribable. Please keep in mind, this is the fight that was being pushed that everyone wanted to see, and it's barely one year since both brothers turned pro. Daiki turned pro at 17 years old, and by the time he was 18 years of age, he was 10-0, just barely in the top 15 ranks by the WBC. Just based on money, clout, and a wave of hype alone, this 18 year old with 10 pro bouts was given the rare opportunity to fight for the WBC and lineal title. And this will be a prime reason why you don't give them youngins title shots. Besides everything about this promotion being something out of an anime, all the way to the final face off. <laughs> It was evidently clear that Daiki was too inexperienced for the well-seasoned champion Naido, and he would take him to school. Daiki would have a full meltdown 
fouling Naito numerous times, Naito would finally retaliate after the relentless fouls, which will lead to a point deduction by Vic Draculich. After point deductions against Kameda, Vic was just ready to pack it up and go home, and let it be. By this point, the crowd had completely changed sides and began to root for Naito. Naito would win by a wide margin of the scorecards. This would be one of the most controversial fights in Japanese boxing history, which was back-to-back -back offenses, coincidentally by the Kameda brothers. This would result in their trainer and father to be permanently banned, Daiki suspended for a while, and they also disciplined Koki. Tomoki, the youngest of the trio, seemed to be the only one spared. This was a, this was really a side mission gone wrong. The WBC and lineal light heavyweight champion Chad Dawson moved down a weight class and fought the lineal and unified super middleweight champion Andre Ward. There was rumors that had spread it the week of the fight on the east side boxing forums that Dawson had gotten KO'd in sparring and he wasn't looking too good. This post was quickly shunned away by the other members and labeled a shit post. Now who knows if this was true but Dawson did look awful that fight. He just seemed off and Ward just broke him down. After the first knockdown in round 3, he just seemed completely sapped and just going through the motions. Ward will put on a show in front of a packed hometown crowd and strategically put away Dawson in the 10th round. Errol Spence Jr. was blue chip as blue chip gets when it comes to his prospects. Now the dude could have waited and been gently moved up the WBA and WBC ranks to where he will be the few guys in line after the winner of Mayweather Pacquiao is decided. That's what I want, a true champion want to take the title from the champion. You know, you don't want it. You don't want to take the title from, from somebody you have to fight because somebody else, because a champion vacated. You know, I want to fight the champion and I want to beat the champion so I can become a true champion. That's what true champions do. But he's like, screw all that. I'm going after that IBF, baby. He swiftly moved up the IBF ranks, defeating top names left and right to earn the mandatory position to fight Kell Brook, which he didn't even show any care in the world and traveled to the UK to fight him in his own backyard. After a highly competitive first half, Spence would gradually take over in the second half to wear down Brook and take him out in the 10th round to become the IBF welterweight champion. Julio Cesar Chavez, a guy who's completed every side mission in life. Those who follow Chavez on social media will know that Julio is fairly active and stays in great shape. And despite at that time being in his 50s, he still puts most people to shame on the heavy bag. This may have started up a trend of exhibition matches from Westerners, as I would say this was a, a success. Chavez had the perfect man to tangle with, which was another Mexican legend, Jorge Arce. Watching this and really thinking about it, I can't help to think this is very wholesome here. Most folks grew up watching these two, maybe had a chance to see them fight, and these very same fans now have kids of their own that they want to introduce boxing to. This was the perfect fight for anyone with that nostalgia and to bring in younger fans who hear of legends from family members at cookouts and fight parties. And it really showed because it was a packed house for this three round exhibition, which is unheard of. They're obviously not loading up upon their shots. And the younger person watching this doesn't know that is blown away by the constant action. Broadcast doesn't do too much justice to show the atmosphere of the first fight. It was electrified, and the crowd was, was really enjoying it. The third round, both were giving everyone their money's worth. The whole crowd chanting Chavez, Chavez, Chavez. <laughs> Yeah. 
Arce will get his headgear knocked off and just to really preserve the moment to put on one last bit of action, the ref put an immediate pulse to the time of the fight to get Arce's headgear back on. As soon as the fight resumed, we would get a memorable final 12 seconds. The first fight was so much of a success that the rematch would be picked up by a bigger network and DAZN would also pitch in for broadcasting rights of this event. Even more fight fans showed up for this one. It's a really wholesome moment for these fighters. Their heydays were well past them and all these fans showed up in support to catch what could be one last glimpse of them in the ring. It's just amazing to see. You gotta give props to the Mexican fans coming in with an open mind and embracing these types of events. Other boxing cultures should take some notes here. The rematch topped off the first fight. Very exciting three rounds and I can only just imagine attending this live. The final round would be just as memorable as the last fight where it was extended after the bell. Chavez and Arce was given a standing ovation by the fight fans around the arena. So this was Mayweather's first fight in his boxing career overseas since his amateur days. Two in Germany where one of them ended in a loss during the AIBA championships and another loss during the prelim round in the Russian 100th anniversary tournament going 1-2 and two on foreign soil. A little over a year later after Floyd's record breaking retirement fight against Conor McGregor. In September of 2018 Floyd visited Japan to start business expanding his brand in the Asian market as there is a lot of money to make and it's also good for the fans as well. Starting with a TMT collaboration with legendary Kyoe boxing gym. This would launch a massive fight against rising kickboxing star Henshin Natsukawa, who today in 2022, according to Typology, is 46 0 with four draws. Before we go in any further, for the people that say, I'm not going to buy this, I'm not watching this, and whatever, firstly, it's not marketed to you in mind, which is pretty obvious. The event started at 4 in the morning, Eastern US time. That should be evident just by that time slot alone. Second, these types of matches are quite popular in Japan and people are willing to invest their money into exhibitions and pretty gnarly matchups. This fight is no different. There's a lot of people outside of America who appreciates Mayweather's craft that never had the privilege to tune in live to see his fights when he was around due to the inconvenient time differences. You see, when I seen that type of love, when I first got to the gym, honestly, chill bumps got on my arm. I was like, oh man, we go at four o'clock in the morning, wait. 
I go to eat somewhere, somewhere in, in London. You got kids that ride their bikes and follow me. They appreciate the, the art of boxing. They really appreciate the art, and they really study boxing. So since no one outside of Asia is making money off this matchup, the first thing they are going to do is FUD the hell out of it and state it's going to be a failure. With all that being said, the organization that's showing the fight, Ryzen, put up a pretty solid undercard for the event. A 14 fight undercard, a lot of familiar faces in the combat sports world, and the stand-up matchup was a co-main between Kyoji Horiguchi versus Darian Caldwell. Caldwell is a reigning Bellator champion. Bellator gave their current champ the green line to go to Japan and fight a Ryzen fighter on their card. I haven't seen anything like this since Dana White was so confident with his UFC stable being the best in the world that he sent Chuck Liddell, the UFC champion at that time, over to Japan to compete in a tournament in Pride. You see, that's Dana White, UFC class act all the way. And again, we talked about the respect that these two uh, have for each other already. And I'm sure we'll come out of this with much more bosses. Now this shows why you don't see cross MMA organization fights because it will break the illusion that one has supremacy over all of MMA. In boxing, you have boxing belt organizations, WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO. In MMA, their organizations, Ryzen, 1FC, Bellator, and the UFC. In boxing, you fight up the ranks of those belt organizations, become champion, and the next step to prove you are the best in that weight class, you unify against other fighters outside that belt organization. MMA doesn't have that. There are no unifications, no cross promotions with other organizations. I dip in and out in the MMA world, but when I saw this, I knew that was pretty ballsy and, and an unprecedented move in the modern age of MMA where there's such a massive divide between organizations. So after 13 fights passed by, Floyd was nowhere to be found in the venue. He had arrived mad late. Tension and his team waited for a while and their hands were already wrapped. Problems would ensue, which would cause a longer delay to the main event because Floyd's team was in disagreement. Yeah. You know, I don't want cut the rap now. He needs to he needs to rewrap cut the, the rap. Because if you don't cut the rap, we're never gonna get started. Really, they need to take care of it. Hey, just understand where we're at. Well, just we're stop at. talking to you. Your, your voice is being wasted right now. Check. Let's check class. What, what, okay. Fishing up. With Tension's team and argued with the commission to force Tension to redo his hand wraps because they were not present to see the process. Now Japan rules are different from Nevada rules. Nevada rules, the team member from the opponent must be present, which seen in the Mayweather Ortiz fight, the rewrap was granted. Well, that, that's not my concern. I, I, I listen, if you ain't got to tell I me about the rules. I understand. Really, I think I've been in this ball game a little longer than yep. you have. I, I think we'd have done this a time or two more than you have. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna be respectful to you, and I, I expect the same. And, and, and I expect the same. I expect the same in return. I'm gonna, all I'm, all I'm saying is that I wasn't here to right. witness the rap. Okay, let us move and what, and what Roger right. said, right. Roger. Roger's not here, good. but it's good. what I'm saying. Now, I don't know the rules in Japan, but Floyd was the obvious A-side, and the show won't go on without him, so Tension's team made a compromise and rewrapped. Floyd was so confident that he didn't even bother to warm up, even stating that he doesn't need to, which it was evidently clear when the bell rung. Floyd was very dry. I don't need to warm up on Floyd Mayweather. let you let other fighters warm up. I'm too dope. I ain't gotta warm up. Uh, no, we're gonna go light. We don't do him like that. He a good kid. We're not gonna do that to him. Show him some love. Now, it was supposed to be, from my point of view, a fun sparring session. Floyd smiling and keeping it easy, but I think with the situation where he arrived mad late and the other drama involving the raps, wanted to beat off that path and try and pull off what I mentioned earlier, a Stanley Ketchel. Floyd throws a lazy lead and tension would parry and throw a blindingly fast counter. Floyd, a bit shocked, just barely dodges it. <laughs> And this is when he probably realizes that this guy is on something else and that smile went to a serious look quick. Floyd clips tension behind the ear which sends him falling to the canvas. Please keep in mind the massive weight disadvantage here. Tension is 126, possibly 130. We can use a Maidana rematch as a reference. Floyd looked visibly smaller in the first fight. Despite not reporting his rematch fight day weight, the size difference between Floyd and Maidana looked a lot different compared to the first. Floyd would immediately jump on Tension, missing a left hook lead. Tension would get a couple good shots in, which Floyd would pick them off and get in some of his own. Floyd lands another shot on the temple of Tension, which he lost his balance briefly, and before he can reset his feet, Floyd strikes him again 
one, almost dropping him. Floyd would cut off the ring in what I'll like to say the pretty boy Floyd stance in reference to his super featherweight days, the way he would stalk his opponents, and he would drop tension another time. <laughs> Tension would almost land a huge counter on Floyd while he was rushing in. Floyd would catch Tension as he's coming in with a hook, which would send Tension down, leading to the stoppage. <laughs> this angle is the most definitive angle because people will try to say it's stage. You can see the force of the shot and his leg going out, resulting for him to hit the canvas immediately. There was no delayed reaction. So despite the Western media slamming it, like I said earlier, they don't benefit from this, it was an overall success. Huge success to where, in 2019, Floyd was already in the process of purchasing a house, getting residency, and also in the process of setting up a MAGA rematch with Pacquiao in, in Japan for 2020. Well, the pandemic would come to ruin all that. Japanese boxing was closed. There was not no bubble that Western nations were doing. They seized all boxing till late 2020. And even then, there was many restrictions for fights and for foreigners. So a Pacquiao rematch in Japan would be out of the question, and so much time had passed by that the WBA wouldn't even allow it. As much as people put down exhibition fights, little people know Naoya Inoue has performed in quite a bit of exciting exhibitions. 2014 he faced lineal champion Akira Yayagashi. 2016 he was against undefeated Genesis Cervania, and what we would be talking about that happened quite recently, which was absolutely amazing and I'm going to cover the whole card here. I think once people have a better understanding what is the purpose of an exhibition fight, I think they would enjoy it for what it is. It's supposed to be fun. The fighters are having fun. It's supposed to be a, a fun sparring session where both the fighters are able to display their skills in a non-threatening manner. It's aimed towards audiences that never watch boxing and younger newer viewers. He's on the attack and a big right there to Arnie's jaw and Arnie coming back but he looked hurt by that one. Well, he's got to keep the fight at long range if he's going to tame this boy because he's a local schoolboy champion and he's undefeated. The people that get their jimmy so rustled, yeah I said that, would be the type of people who would go to a movie theater and watch a movie like The Expendables expecting Martin Scorsese like storytelling, Academy Award cinematography, and Dunkirk realism and then go to complain about it. You're taking it way too seriously, just sit back and enjoy it for what it is. This is probably one of the best exhibition cards Japan has put up, a stacked card of legends, current champs, and up and comers, long reigning former champs champion Takashi Uchiyama going at it at the age of 41 against Japanese champion Kosuke Saka. <laughs> Uchiyama opted not to wear the headgear for the full fight, while Kosuke opted to wear headgear for the first two rounds. The fight start to finish was rather entertaining. The next fight, undefeated prospect and Mayweather Gem student Andy Hiraoka was up against Japanese national champion Yuta Akiyama. <laughs> Oh, 
One of the standout fights was between Japanese national team fighter Sewan Okazawa and Japanese prospect Jin Sasaki. Both fighters opted for no headgear, and from the opening bell, these guys were putting on a show having fun. The final round was just amazing, and to top it off in the final 20 seconds, both guys will end it going toe to toe. Next bout was between three-time former champion and former lineal champion Akira Yaegashi and current ring and unified champion Hiroto Kyoguchi. Despite being retired since 2020, Yayagashi looked great. This looked like a legitimate sparring session you would see behind closed doors. Very entertaining and to end it off with an exciting final round. The next bout will be between former K1 champion and current OPBF champion in boxing, the undefeated Yoshiki Takei against former flyweight champion Sho Kimura. The former K1 champ and now boxer really showed his skills that he will someday be in the mix for a world title. <laughs> Now lastly, pound for pound star Naoya Inoue versus former champion Daigo Higa. Now these two found a way to one up everyone on the card. This was a spectacular exhibition and brilliant display of boxing. Despite this being a light to mid sparring match. <laughs> You know his competitive nature refused to let Higa land anything without catching a sneaky shot in return, which snapped Higa's head back. The speed, the combinations were all in display by Inoue. This is possibly one of the greatest displays of skill in an exhibition fight. Legend and the multiple promotions involved deserve massive credit for putting together such an event. This is an exhibition done right, using active and retired fighters. Up! 
パーで来る左フック笑ってる答えていますこうしてもうわー右強烈な諦めない諦めないもんね,もんね取れません右ストライト入れましたこの二人の戦いはこれが最初で最後なのかそれともまだ先があるのかここで終了I feel like if more people saw this, there would be more of an appreciation for it on a worldwide scale instead of confined in the Pacific region. And on top of that, this is when boxers do side missions. For another installment, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to the Patreon for Patreon-backed projects and early access. I'm Alfa Sancho, and I'm out.